<laughs> oh, I'm excited for this video, everyone. I don't get to bust these out too often, all right? Gaze upon the greatest example of eyewear ever created. The Don Quixote Do Flamingo glasses. Oh, yes. Truly magnificent they are. With a metal wire frame forged in an active volcano 700,000 years ago. Smelted with ore taken from an alien world. Brought here by aliens that then subsequently exploded upon entering our atmosphere. Glass taken from sand that was struck by lightning on high from the almighty Zeus. These are truly, really nice sunglasses. They are really fashionable, very comfortable, and also they just look cool, okay? So there you go. All right. So today we are going to be talking about the flamingo in the machine, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it seems like a very popular theory as of late. Because, like, honestly, like I said in the review, I have no idea who the egghead trader is. And at this point, it could be, like, anybody within reason, within reason, all right? Like, if it turns out it was Captain Kuro this whole time, well, he is a pretty smart guy. No, no, it's not Captain Kuro. Okay, it still has to make sense. What I'm basically saying here is that Oda could take a bunch of different avenues with this, and I would be happy with a lot of them, okay? If it turns out it was one of the uh, the satellites this whole time, I think that makes sense. If it turns out it was a few satellites working together, if it turns out it was all the satellites, if it turns out there was a seventh satellite hiding somewhere, if it turns out there were evil versions of all the satellites, if it turns out it was Punk Records, whatever. If it turns out it was Eam, if it turns out it was Stussy, like a lot of these examples I would be okay with, all right? But um, I think a lot of what something a lot of people are focusing on right now is the idea that it's actually another Seraphim, one of the Seraphim we actually have not got to see yet, and because we've only seen four of them, Jinbei, Boa's, Mihawk's, and Kuma's Seraphims. However, obviously there's way more than just four seven Warlords of the Sea. In fact, there's even more than seven Warlords of the See, I think if you take every single warlord that has been a warlord throughout the story, I think there's easily like maybe a dozen, <laughs> a dozen warlords of the sea because you got to include Blackbeard in there and Crocodile and Law and Weevil and Buggy. So right there, that's like five. So yeah, there, there might be an even dozen, maybe even a baker's dozen of warlords, okay? But there's one in particular that everybody's focusing on right now, and that is Don Quixote Do Flamingo Seraphim, which would of course be S. Flamingo! Yes, and in fact, uh, Morge made a video about this a couple weeks ago. Really solid video, so I'd recommend to go check that out here. I have Morge right over here uh, turned into plushy form, so uh, I'll just have him back here. And there you go. There's Morge right there. Okay, cool. So I don't know if those plushies are still available, but if they are, go check them out. They're really cool. Okay, so, um, Morris did that video, and he talked about actually two options. He talked about the opportunity of the Blackbeard Pirates taking advantage of the chaos on Egghead, and they're the ones that are behind everything. And then his second suspect was, uh, Doflamingo Seraphim S. Flamingo, and he went through a bunch of options here. You know, uh, the most notable of one is something that actually got brought up very early in Egghead, where, remember when the Straw Hats arrived and those sea monsters attacked, and they had to fight against that giant mechanical shark. It was more of a cyborg shark. It was taking an actual shark shark and then turned it into a, a mechanical sea beast to fight for, you know, Egghead to defend the island. And Lilith had a line that was something like, you know, it doesn't matter how many times we modify this thing or we change around its programming. You can just not unprogram like the primal like uh, motivation of an animal okay you just can't you can't program that out that instinct I should say um, it's just impossible okay so that might be and that was like chapter one of Egghead or maybe like right as soon as the Straw Hat showed up to the outskirts of Egghead that was stated so it kind of brings up the idea of like okay you can't program out instinct it's it's always going to be there no matter what and that might be the x factor so to speak that might be the thing that's just not necessarily an issue with uh doflamingo seraphim that we're going to get into in a moment that might be the issue with all of the seraphim and morge i'll tell you what in that video, at the very end, he had an idea that was so creepy to me, just the way he put it. And it was like, what if 
the traitors are the seraphim, but no one's controlling the seraphim. Because that's the big twist. Like, we think somebody, because, like, we've been given the rules of how the seraphim are ordered around. Where anybody with a command chip, and then Sentomaru after that, and then the satellites and Vegapunk after that, and then the Gorosei at the very top. So, remember, way back when we first were introduced to the satellites, I was saying, like, hey, don't pay attention to the rules that Oda's giving us, because he could always break those rules. Like, he says there's only six satellites, there could be a seventh one. There could be Satellite Zero walking around. We don't know. And in the same way, Morge brought up this thing with like, hey, just because Oda gave us that hierarchy, we think that that's how the hierarchy has to go. He could always break those rules. And Morge's idea was like, what if the Seraphim have basically become self-aware? You know? And they're just like, no, they're not being controlled by anybody. They're acting on their own accord. And their own accord is to, you know, cast off the chains of those that built them and also tried to bind them and and now go off and do their own thing. Now, uh, that is one possibility, but I have another idea I kind of want to tackle with this, okay? So, uh, the believability of it being S. Flamingo, especially after the last chapter, chapter 1077, is, uh, you know, quite feasible, I would say, uh, in the fact that uh, Shaka got shot in the face, and then you saw, you know, the gun barrels. So, when it just comes to talking about it, that kind of situation, Do Flamingo is definitely about shooting family members, okay? He shot his dad, and then he shot his brother, uh, and so now you could say he shot, well, I guess his superior, so to speak, you know, because the satellites order around the Seraphim, so in a sense you could say that kind of goes along with that. Also, if we're going back to the whole thing with you can't program out natural instinct, um, this makes me think of a underlying sort of theme that Odo was tackling during the Dressrosa arc as the dichotomy between uh, Don Quixote do Flamingo and Don Quixote Roshinate, his brother. Okay, so they weren't twin brothers. They were born like, you know, like uh, Roshinate was a little bit younger than do Flamingo. I think it was two years younger than them. But the overall thing is, you know is evil something that is like, you know, nature versus nurture? Like, how does this go? Because you had Homing and his wife that were very kind parents. They were nice people. They were good people. They were just a little naive on exactly, you know, what they did when they left Marijuana and just expected to, like, live amongst the people, just admitting, oh, yes, we are, we used to be world nobles from Marijuana, but not any longer. We decided to move here, and all of a sudden, I'm a Scottish guy now. I don't know why Don Quixote Homing is Scottish, but whatever. All right. That's a horrible Scottish accent, but I don't know why I went with it, but all right. So, um, they're really good people, and Roshinate turned out to be a really good person as well, but Doflamingo was the one that was, like, the, uh, the outstanding, uh, family member, so to speak. The one that was just like, okay, no, kind of straight up evil, like, kind of right from the beginning, you know? And so, there's a little bit of a theme there going on, so it's the idea that, like, okay, if we're really going along with this, like, this nature versus nurture argument, and Doflamingo was just naturally evil, um, the idea of taking some of his DNA, his lineage factor, which they would definitely have, uh, I would assume they would have that from all of the original warlords, even if they didn't, uh, Doflamingo is currently an impel down level 6, so getting their hands on it wouldn't really be all that difficult, um, and so they got his DNA, and then they made a seraphim of him, S. Flamingo, except this one is a little bit different from the others, maybe a little bit defective, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Vegapunk and the rest of the satellites were like working on him and they're like oh there's something strange with this Seraphim's programming no matter what we do it, it seems like there's like a computer virus or something and it turns out the computer virus is evil evil you know you cloned evil how dare you Vegapunk science be damned okay and you know what like that is the thing that makes him kind of like not like he's able to override his security protocols so to speak and that natural evil is able to break through and now he can kind of roam around and maybe he activated himself maybe they put him in like cold storage or something we're just gonna like keep him in the tube until we figure out all these programming issues this is strange you know because you know you have all the other seraphim that are awakens up till now we have mihawk we have kuma we have uh boa and and we have, um, uh, Jinbei, obviously, okay. Now, out of all of those characters, none of them are evil, 
okay? Mihawk is very neutral. Kuma is definitely, I would say, neutral going on good and the idea that he's a member of the Revolutionary Army, so he was called the Tyrant, but Kuma was very clearly not evil, you know, not nearly on the same level, not even approaching the level of Doflamingo. Uh, Boa is, you know, a little bit narcissistic and she's a little bit arrogant. Okay, kind of a lot arrogant, but I wouldn't call her evil. And so that's the situation with them. But then you get to Doflamingo, who... From his actions ever since he was a little kid, all the way up to now, he is evil. Like, that's just the thing with Doflamingo, okay? I remember I did a, uh, like, a One Piece quiz a while back, you know, and I, I can't remember the exact, like, nature of the quiz or whatever, but one of the questions was, who is the worst villain in One Piece? Like, who is, like, objectively the most evil villain in One Piece? And, you know, it listed off Raw Bluchi and, like, Crocodile and Kaido and then Doflamingo, and I'm looking at all of them, and I'm like, man, in terms of probably body count alone, I would probably say Luchi and Kaido might be higher than Doflamingo, but, like... Like, God, Doflamingo is so evil, though. Like, so irredeemably evil in this story. So I think I ended up going with Doflamingo there, right? So, we're not exactly done yet with this angle of taking it. It's like, okay, you know, S. Flamingo, you know, just because of his nature and you couldn't program that out and he got his instinct, he was able to activate himself. Uh, he was able to move around without the security protocols binding him down. You know, even if one of the Gorosei gave him an order, he would not obey. So, here's the way of looking at that, okay? So, we've already explained that it's feasible for, like, because this was already explained with the satellites, how they, uh, they synchronize with punk records once a day to kind of upload all of their data, right? Well, what if it's not impossible for Doflamingo to do this as well, or S. Flamingo to do this as well, to kind of, like, hack into punk records, okay? And corrupt all of punk records with the evil virus, okay? Like, something like that. And, uh, you know, because the Seraphim don't seem to be able to link up to punk records, but the satellites could. So, might it be possible that S. Flamingo, while he was being worked on by one of the satellites, let's say Edison or Pythagoras, who are two clearly, like, robot versions of Vegapunk, you know? I, I mean, they might all have that kind of, like, they all have to sort of have, like, a little bit of cyborg enhancements to even connect to punk records. So even the ones that look more human, like York and Lilith, and we don't even exactly know what Shaka truly looks like. Uh, Atlas is just really big. Atlas looks human on the outside, but her face was broken by Luchi, and she's very clearly a robot on the inside. And she even says that, you know, she can replace their face as long as they have, like, spare parts. So Lilith is probably more android than human. Same thing with Shaka. Shaka got shot, and there was blood. Um, they might have brains, but it's, like, maybe a combination of both. Anyway, it's not Im impossible for maybe, like, okay, Pythagoras or Edison or somebody. It might have been Pythagoras, and actually Pythagoras, it would make sense because he was the first one that was attacked, okay? So I'm gonna, you know, throw this scenario out there. Pythagoras being wisdom, you know, let's say they hear about, like, oh, we're working on the new Seraphim, Seraphim number five, I guess it would be, S. Flamingo, but there's some complications with the computer programming. There's some kind of error in the program. We just can't get it to work right. They like he's not responding to the security protocols right. So we just we turned him off for right now. He's in his tank. Um, and then Pythagoras would be interested being the Vegapunk that governs wisdom. So he's like, all right, I'm going to go figure this out. I'm going to go learn about what's happening with this Seraphim, this virus that's corrupting him, and see if I can work with this. And so while he's there working on that, S. Flamingo, like, hacks into his brain, uploads this virus or something, and then Pythagoras begins to work with S. Flamingo. And so then, since he connected to Pythagoras, S. Flamingo would therefore be able to synchronize with Punk Records, corrupting all of Punk Records. So then it gets to the whole point where the Frontier Dome is shut down, the Seraphim are now running around, they are basically seemingly like uh, either being controlled by somebody with very malevolent intent, or on their own, as, as Mord stated, maybe this is like, oh, I free all of the Seraphim, you are now free to do whatever you desire. And that's the immediate thing they, they jump to is uh, fighting for their own freedom, okay? Um, you could even kind of frame it in a way of the Seraphim might not be like evil in that direct sense, but they're at least trying to eliminate Vegapunk so they can get off of the island and they can go do their own thing. Maybe you could spin it like that, not really sure. Um, and at the center of all of this, though, 
is S Flamingo. You could also get Caribou involved as well. Caribou, you know, turns into mud. He gets kicked off the sunny pretty much. Remember, Zoro effectively kicked him out. You know, Caribou was there and he's just like, ah, hey guys, how you doing? Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, uh, I know you, you said you would drop me off at the nearest island, but uh, this is a government island, so I was wondering maybe the next island. And Zoro's like, all right, yeah, well, nice seeing you, buddy. See ya. And so he really had no choice but to leave. And so he goes back in the lab and he's like looking around and he bumps into S Flamingo. And then S Flamingo is the one that's just like, you know, listen to me or I kill you. And Caribou's like, okay, yeah, sure. What do you want me to do? Go eliminate those cameras. All right, can do, boss. And he goes away. And so then it's it's that situation there, right? Um, that would also, I think, go in line with the shocked expression that um, uh, Vegapunk, the main Stella body, had at the end of chapter 1077, where he was kind of shocked at the person walking down the steps. It, it could have been shocked at the person. It could have also been shocked at the idea that Shaka got shot in the head right in front of him. So that could have also been the thing there. Actually, after the last chapter, pretty much all of the satellites have been taken out. So, Oda might be trying to set it up, like, hey, all the satellites are taken out. Shaka got shot, Lilith is turned to stone, uh, Edison got taken out by S-Shark, um, we have Pythagoras, who's only in his, his head right now, because his main body got destroyed, Atlas is still around, she's the only one left other than Pythagoras' head, and then York also got turned to stone by S-Snake, okay? So, Oda might be setting it up, like, okay, these satellites are getting taken out left to right, so that means the satellites must not be involved in, in the traitor, you know, uh, subplot, right? Uh, because they're all taken out, but what if it's a thing that's like, oh no, this was a way to like, oh, they're all get taken out and then S uh, Flamingo will revive them later. Um, because if S Flamingo did do the virus thing and controls all the Seraphim or whatever, then he could pretty much do whatever. Uh, he could like reawaken the satellites later or he could destroy them. I mean, S Flamingo's main goal might just be like, yes, eliminate everybody on the island at first, turn them to stone, we'll crush them later, you know, and, and then we'll work on our next stage of operations, okay? Because on top of being evil, Do Flamingo's also very intelligent, okay? So I think with his intelligence and his malevolent nature, uh, putting those two together in like this robot, cyborg, android, Lunarian, warlord, green blood filled form, who would also probably have the Ito Ito no Mi. Same thing with, you know, how um, S Snake has Bo as Devil Fruit and S Bear has Kuma as Devil Fruit, respectively. Kind of the same thing there, getting Doflamingo's blood. Like the fact that Doflamingo, if they had his blood to begin with to make a Seraphim, he also there Therefore, has Doflamingo's Devil Fruit because it's all in the blood. It's all in the lineage factor, okay? But yeah, that was just one of many uh, possibilities that just like has been floating around in my head the last couple of days. It's just like, okay, because I do like that theory that Punk Records is behind everything. Like Punk, Rec Punk Records either became self-aware or something. And I'm thinking, what if it wasn't just Punk Records becoming self-aware? What if it's like a computer virus kind of thing? You know, it's like, okay, if a virus is because everything's running on robotics and stuff like that, including the Pacifista Mark III. So what if it's a virus? Okay, well, how would a computer virus even exist? You know what I mean? Because computers themselves in One Piece, like, they only really exist on Egghead. So that would mean if there is some kind of computer virus to corrupt everything, all of the satellites and the Seraphim alike and the Pacifistas, that virus would have to originate from Egghead, which means Vegapunk probably indirectly would have had to make it. Okay, and then everything just kind of ties back to S Flamingo being evil and then the natural instinct to be like, what if it's an evil computer virus, like a sentient evil computer virus that's infected everything. Okay, um, and you could say everything, all the actions of the satellites up until now, maybe Flamingo was smart enough to be like, I won't infect Shaka. I'll let Shaka do his own thing to kind of like, you know, lure them into the island and the false sense of security, get everybody in the lab, and then I'll eliminate them. Maybe something like that, I don't know. Uh, but I would imagine S. Flamingo's ultimate goal would not be to like work with anybody. It would probably be the ultimate goal would be to eliminate all of the satellites, eliminate Vegapunk, Maybe the reason he's keeping him alive right now is to lure the other satellites out. But why would he be able to do that if he could just, like, corrupt them and have them all, like, die immediately? So, yeah, there are holes with this. This isn't, like, um, you know, a perfect theory or anything. But I, I like that idea. I like the idea of evil becoming a computer virus. That's something that I think Oda could could juggle with. That sounds really cool. But anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for watching the video, everybody. Uh, that's that.
Uh, we got uh, Doflamingo and Morge over here. I haven't used this pop figurine of Dofi in a while, so I dug it out of my little uh, case, and it looks like he just has, like, blueberry jam all over his mouth. So, I don't know what that's about, but okay. I want you to imagine for a moment Doflamingo getting up in the middle of the night. He's hungry. And he's like, ah, I hunger. And then he goes downstairs in, like, his bathrobe into his kitchen, and he makes himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then he just sits there in his kitchen at, like, 2 o'clock in the morning and just eats a PB&J sandwich. It's weird, right? It's weird, but it's like, he th that probably happened at some point. <laughs> it probably happened, you know? He probably woke up and he's like, I'm hungry, I got the munchies. He goes downstairs, he makes him a PBJ with, you know, blueberry jam or whatever. And he just sits there and he's in his kitchen just eating it in his castle on Dress Rosa. And then, and then somebody walks in, like Buffalo walks in in the middle of the night, just like, oh, sorry, Dofi, I just wanted a glass of milk. And Doflamingo's goes there, and he's just like, of course, Buffalo, just go in there, get, have a glass of milk. I'm just a little bit, uh, can't sleep that great, just eating a sandwich. <laughs> just like, okay. Doflamingo cared about his family, you know. I've just been awkward, just weird to think about, but there you go. Oh, anyway, we also have snake facts. Okay, I'm going off on a tangent about that. Right, snake facts, let's go! Snake Facts. Okay, on this action-packed episode of Snake Facts, we are just getting right to it. What is the most venomous snake in the entire world? I want to know the snake that bites me, the two-step viper. I want to know that viper that bites me, you're dead before you take two steps, all right? Okay, so there's no snake that's quite that venomous, but there is a snake that is pretty damn venomous. Um, I'm just going to, like, I don't even have to say it. Where do you think... The most venomous snake in the world is. Like, everybody already arrived at the... It's Australia, of course. Okay, here's a little bit of a rule of thumb, okay? The most poisonous or venomous of anything comes from Australia. It's just how it ends up going. I don't know how human beings can live on that continent, all right? It seems like a constant struggle with nature, all right? Well, anyway, the most venomous snake in the entire world is the inland uh, taipan, or the western taipan, because there's also a coastal version that lives closer to the coast, and then this one lives more inland in Australia. Um, the aboriginal tribes of Australia called it a dondarabilla, uh, and it's funny because I'm looking at all these different, like, poisonous, not poisonous, but venomous snakes online. And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, yes, this snake is venomous. And then there'll be other articles that'll say this uh, snake is highly venomous. For the inland taipan, it said this snake is extremely venomous. So we go from venomous, very venomous, highly venomous, extremely venomous. Woo! extreme all right it's even more uh venomous than any other reptile and that includes sea snakes which by the way is they're sea snakes so that'll be another installment of snake facts at some point um its venom is enough to kill 100 humans in one bite that's if it only bites you once which it probably won't because while it is very meek and shy and will only bite when it's provoked uh, when it does bite it's extraordinarily accurate and it will bite you multiple times, probably around the same area. And unlike a lot of other snakes that can do something called a dry bite, where you might have a venomous snake that might bite you, but might not inject any venom into you, it's kind of just more of like a warning to like get away. You know, I think rattlesnakes can do that. So like a rattlesnake could bite you in the US. Now if you get bit by a rattlesnake, go to the doctor. But it's possible the rattlesnake could just bite you and not inject any venom, just kind of give you a dry bite. Um, in the case with the inland taipan, that is not the situation. Um, there is an 80 percent chance of envenomation uh, when you get bit by this thing. And in terms of the lethality rate, that's also over 80%. So that's if you get bit and you do not seek or you do not reach medical attention soon enough, 80% um, chance plus that you will die, all right? Um, some other interesting things about this snake, though, it actually changes its skin depending on the time of the year, so its skin can absorb light better, obviously being cold-blooded, it preys on warm-blooded organisms, so this is what it looks like in the summer, and this is what it looks like in the winter, so it's like a Pokemon region variant, uh, it's kind of like that deer Pokemon from Gen 5, Deerling, that changes with the seasons, it's, it's kind of like that, but extraordinarily, extremely venomous, okay, uh, oh, this is fun, uh, it can inject up to 110 milligrams max 
maximum of its venom. Now, there are other snakes that do have a higher venom yield than that. I think even the American rattlesnake has a higher venom yield maximum, but when you get a look at this venom cocktail that it injects into you, you're going to see pretty quick, okay? So, this venom contains a lovely combination of neurotoxins for your nerves, hemotoxin for your blood, myotoxin for your muscles, nephotoxin for your kidneys, and something called hela... Heliorondias uh, enzyme. Okay, it has a type of enzyme that gets the venom absorbed into your body faster. So this thing is like, imagine if there was a video game where, you know, it's completely open world and you play as a snake and you can like upgrade your snake with like different like aspects, you know, just like venom plus one plus two. Oh man, my snake's got plus four venom and he has an enzyme that gets the venom, you know, uh, permeating into your skin quicker. Oh sweet, myotoxin upgrade. Now I can render your muscles, you know, completely stiff. Oh sweet, neurotoxin, nice. Now I can immobilize. It's just like then you have this snake that's equipped with all these bonuses and stuff like a level 99 snake bites something it's just like oh god no and it's like it locks up and it freezes blood congeals venom goes into shock and dies <sighs> stay away from australia i would love to visit i have lots of friends there i have lots of fans you know that live in australia that tell me hey you can come visit sometime i, just... <laughs> I don't know man I don't know. Maybe if I had, like, an Iron Man power suit, maybe. Okay. Anyway, thanks for watching the video, everybody. This will be Tech Exciting out.